A good place to start is Google Scholar. Google Scholar is a, basically a, the largest online repository <coughs> of free knowledge. When you are on campus, you can access it for free. You can download these articles, just punch in your keywords like you would in Google. You can download these articles. There is also, at Aston, there is also, I, I know there's a, uh, Aston has its own system, the e-library. I don't remember exactly what it's called. But you can search it either through the library or through here. Every university subscribes to a number of databases uh, with art research articles. So naturally, it's, it's always very good to check it out and it's free for you when you're on campus. Download PDFs and print them out, read them in, in your leisure time or read them from your screen, especially if you've got a, a tablet, or iPad, all the posh people here, all the high-tech people here. It's, 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 a, it's a great thing, really. Tablets are so great for reading academic papers. You just scroll with your fingers and it's so, it's so convenient. You can do it on, in public transport and wherever you want. Sorry, I, I'm not employed by Apple, if, uh, if anyone has any doubt. I'm just, I'm just telling my own experience. And finally, you can use websites, serious journalism and email correspondence for your research. And once again, here you have to be really critical. Here you need to know what websites you're using, what journalism you are referring to, and who are you corresponding with. Websites, of course, serious websites, governmental websites, websites of international organizations, that can be used. What personal blogs made by some trolls on the internet, not so much. <laughs> serious journalism. The Times versus The Sun. The Economist versus Cosmopolitan. What do you reference? Well, it's up to you, but I would be very careful with the second ones, with, this, with the second choice. Email correspondence. If you happen to know somebody, who, uh, by the way, never reference a free newspaper, what if, the one you find, find on the bus. Sorry, I'm, I'm not allowed to talk badly about uh, any media, but you know, the one you find on the bus is not a good, a good reference. Email correspondence. When you know somebody who who's, has authority in your field, if you email them and they, are, they kindly respond to you, feel free to reference that email. That's valid. That's legitimate. Research tips. Make sure it's relevant, make sure it answers your question. When you are looking at an academic paper, read the paper, read the abstract, the introduction, the conclusion. What's in the middle is statistics, it's analysis, it's not really relevant yet. You need to find out if the paper is relevant by reading the, the beginning and the end. Then you'll be able to do it. Make notes while you're reading. Oh, observe research ethics. There is a, I think, um, the Dean of English Studies, Carol Marley, has this great story about a linguist who was secretly recording uh, her friends when they came for dinner and uh, then published a book based on the analysis of their conversations. The people read the book, recognized themselves and said, bloody hell, you've been recording us secretly and didn't tell us and they didn't want to be friends with her anymore. So naturally, there are many reasons why you should observe research ethics. Two reasons. Because you fail if you don't and because you do want to keep your friends. I think the second one is even more important. So tell your tell you the objects of your study, the, the, the subjects of your study, what you're doing and why you're doing it. Make sure they know. Make notes while you're reading. It's a good thing to do. Carefully note down all references. You give that book to the library. Oh, what was it called now? Uh, oh, Google doesn't have it. Mm, Amazon mm, neither. Bad. Too bad. Your computer crashes. That can be. That can happen. That's very bad. You, fire, you lose your memory stick, and it's not at the security at Aston. You lost it somewhere in the street. No, no good. And you've got all these papers there, and you didn't note in a separate document where you got them from, and all the URLs. Well, you have to research them. You have to search them up again, and they may not, may not be available anymore. You never know. Back it up. Computers do catch fire. Yes, it happens once. It happened once to one of the students at Aston. Computers do break. Documents do disappear. Technology is evil. It's good when it works, but other, at other times it's evil. I lost huge pieces of writing myself. It's very bad. Back it up. On every single USB drive you have, put it on your Blackberry, put it on your iPhone, put it on every single device that has a memory card. Even on, You can put it on your camera card. <laughs> send it to your email. Send it to your Gmail, Aston Mail, Yahoo Mail. Back it up in as many places as possible. It's 
Be, I, I, I'm not being paranoid. Stuff happens. <laughs> Literature review. Uh, another pain in the neck. What is the literature review? It is a critical summary of ma main research you have found on the subject. It is just a critical summary. Very simple when on screen, not very simple when you're trying to fit on paper. Why do you need to do it? Because you've done your reading, because you know your topic, and because you, know, you want to show your reader that you've done your reading and you know your topic, and you are aware of the weaknesses. Not only of your own experiment design, because there are weaknesses in your experiment design as well. When I was the first year, I, did, I, I thought there weren't. Being aware of other people's weaknesses, the limitations of their data set, the limit, how did they get their information? How many people did they actually interview? How, how legitimate is that paper? How representative is that paper? A passable review consists of the following elements. Main theories, textbooks, how they were applied, journals, Research methods used by others and research design used by others. Comprehensive? Yes, but only possible. Why? Because it doesn't tell you or your reader how all of this is relevant to what you're writing. A first class review consists of the following elements. That on the previous screen and why do you choose these theories? It's very simple, you know. It's been used before, it's been used by these people. I want to test if it's valid still, if it's valid for this data. That, that can be just as simple as that. How did others obtain their results? Well, how many people did that person interview to publish that grand, groundbreaking paper? If you interviewed 2,000 people, that's good. If you surveyed 20,000 people, that's even better. If you interviewed three people and wrote a groundbreaking paper, well, that's a fake. Sorry, guys. Similarities and differences in study design. How similar or different is your study design to that of others? That will help you predict your results. Predict your hypothesis. What exactly is going to happen when you run that experiment? Is, any, is it going to explode like it did in Smith 9299? Or is it going to catch fire like it did in Johnson 9297? You can predict your results based on your experiment design and the similarities and differences between what you are doing and between what others have done. And finally, as I said in the original contribution, how new is your data? How original? What contribution will it bring to your field of study? Analysis and discussion after you've analyzed your data. So what have you found? Analysis. What have you found during your experiment? And then discussion. Why such results? What are, are they based on the differences or similarities between your research and that of others? Or maybe there are different methods, different participants. Why are your results similar or different? This is part of critical thinking. This is what being critical means. And finally, being very critical is acknowledging your limitations. Uh, I have a quote for you from Shinru Suzuki, a Japanese philosopher. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the experts, there are few. And uh, as you progress through your um, degree, I think you start understanding that, that what I have found is not universally valid. What I have found is only valid for those 20 people I interviewed, only for those people I've surveyed, only for those people I've examined, only for that bit of data uh, only, uh, that, that I got, only for that bit of numerical data I got out of my physics experiment, only for that text I've examined, that's valid. But I cannot make universal claims based on my own limited research. And that's why I need to acknowledge your limitations. First of all, why do you need to do it? Well, your lecturer will like it. Being uh, able to acknowledge your limitations, being able to say, I have found this, but it's not doesn't, doesn't apply to the entire world. I know what my limitations are, I know what the weaknesses of my research are. This is very mature. All researchers do it, and so should you. No theory is perfect. A perfect theory with universal scope is called reality. Theories always ex do exclude some elements to be able to focus on others. Theories are like tinted lenses. 
When you look at the world through the red tinted lens, the world looks red, although it's not. That's, that's your theory. No data set is perfect. There is no perfect data set, no matter how huge your data set actually is, it's only representative of itself, not of the entire world. No research method is perfect. There is an entire school of thought based on research methods, uh, combining them, uh, combining two, three, uh, triangulation and all that. This school of thought did not exist, would not exist if research methods were perfect, if every single one of them was perfect. They all have their limitations. This video course is presented to you in association with thelectureroom.co.uk and firstyearcounts.com. Feel free to check out our websites. Also feel free to like our Facebook pages, facebook.com slash thelectureroom1 for the lecture room and facebook.com slash first.year.counts for firstyearcounts.com. This course is based on my book, From Confusion to Conclusion, How to Write a First Class Essay. The book can be purchased from Amazon as a paperback and as a Kindle ebook. If you don't own a Kindle reader, Amazon has many applications for your PC, Mac, smartphone or tablet to download for free and read this book wherever you want, on whatever device you want. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at first.year.counts at gmail.com Also, if you liked this video, feel free to talk about it. Share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and if you decide to purchase my book and you like it, please write me a review on Amazon. Thank you very much, enjoy reading, enjoy writing.